Good morning. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the topic of opportunism and accountability in advertising. Now, in honor of our theme turning points in 20th century America, it only seemed appropriate to begin my remarks neither in the 20th century nor in America. Rather, we're going to begin in London in 1864. Now, a man's returning home from work, and as he approaches home, there's a courier standing outside his door, and he places a telegram in the man's hand. Well, typically at this point in time, telegrams weren't the cheapest thing to send, so to receive one implied one of two things, either importance or urgency. So you can understand the man's reaction whenever he actually receives the telegram expecting something important, and instead he sees this. It says, Gabriel Dentist at 27 Harley Street in Cavendish Square until October are open from 10 a.m. until 5 p.m. So here, we have our first documented form of spam. Telegram spam, nonetheless, right? Now this man does what any of us might. He sits down with a pen and a piece of paper, and he writes his local Times paper. And he says, I've never had any dealings with Gabriel dentists. By what right are they messaging me? By something that is simply a means of advertisement. And I like this part. A word from you, I would feel sure, would put a stop to this intolerable nuisance. So, within hours of the first spam message, we have our first Marcus spam. Now, interestingly, spam didn't exist as a term in 1864. That's a phrase we wouldn't actually get until the 1990s in response to, of all things, a 1970s Monty Python sketch. All right? Now, in this sketch, a couple of diners walk into a diner and start having a conversation with the waitress. And they ask the waitress, what's on the menu? And as the waitress goes through, everything has spam in it. There's spam and eggs, spam, spam and eggs, spam, bacon, spam and eggs. And in that moment, we also have a group of Vikings sitting off to the side. And every time that that waitress says spam, the Vikings, start singing spam, 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 wonderful spam. It gets to the point that it drowns out all other significant, meaningful conversation in the restaurant. So it's understandable then in the 1990s why the perception of spam in that encounter would be applied to marketing and advertising. It drowns out all other communication. I would imagine folks in the 1980s probably felt the same when you're working in a business office and you walk up to the, the actual fax machine to pull off something that you think is important, and you're flipping through and you find a full-page ad encouraging you to take a vacation to Barbados, right? So we also had spam reemerge in the 1980s with fax machines. Then, of course, we all know our inboxes are filled today with email spam. And to jump to today, we actually see that the estimate is that 45 to 73 percent of all messages sent are spam. And on a daily basis, approximately 70 billion spam messages are sent globally. If you think about this in terms of direct mail, all of that junk mail that you get to your house, did you realize that more than 62 billion pieces of junk mail are produced each year, which is the equivalent of 4 million tons? Right? Now, marketers aren't nearly as cute as this picture of this puppy up here, but they do have quite the storied history of being places often before customers even truly arrive. For example, with the emergence of automobiles, advertisers were very quick to the game to put billboards up along the roadways. Or we see the first TV ad show up in 1941 before a Dodger Phillies baseball game, and the ad says America runs on Belova time, which apparently means 18 years before TVs each even reach 90% of American households. Or how about web banner ads? This was in 1994, and advertisers were already on the game when there were a grand total of 2,700 websites on the World Wide Web, compared to approximately 1 billion today. Now, we can't talk about the opportunism of advertisers without also talking about the messaging side of it. So advertisers, leading into the 1900s, <clears throat> we, there were a lot of snake oil salesmen out there, right? peddling wares, medical products, things that would cure anything that ails you. So, you would find things like this cocaine toothache drop, right? Or how about this one? This is Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. It says, the mother's friend for teething children. So when you have that child that can't sleep because their teeth are coming in, give them some of Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup. Of course, the main ingredients here are alcohol and morphine. So those babies probably slept pretty well, right? 
But you see this with most of the things, or many of the things that were actually being peddled at that point in time, that often the leading ingredient was alcohol, and occasionally things that were so toxic that they actually did more harm than the thing that they were purported to cure. This one right here for Horsford's acid phosphate. Acid phosphate actually isn't as bad as what you might think it is. Um, this is actually a flavoring agent that was used in soda early on. It was often found at um, soda stations, drink fountains at uh, drug stores. But the humor here is that they were actually advertising the fact that, here, basically drink a soda and it will help protect you from cholera. Right? So this is kind of flipping the other direction. And then when we reach the mid-1900s, we see advertisers take a little bit different approach, still related to the health aspect of things, but this is an actual cigarette ad from the mid-1900s where Camel says, hey, we did a survey of all of the doctors in the country, and we found that among all the doctors, the preferred cigarette of choice is Camel cigarettes. So if you don't know why they're awesome, now you know. Now, I love the attention to detail in this ad because they even emphasize to really sell that red M and that red D for that MD, right? They want to nail home the medical benefits of this. Meanwhile, in the lower corner, we've got this lovely looking woman where it emphasizes the T-zone of her face, that part that gives you the, the beautiful, youthful appearance that you have, emphasizing how healthy this will make you look and feel. Of course, alcohol distributors get in on the game as well, so we see them encouraging you to find fresh strength and life in every glass. Really have to appreciate this one because in this one, Rainier Beer even encourages you to start nurturing that drinking habit in your child while they're young. Right? Nothing says family bonding like a grandfather and a granddaughter clinking glasses. Now, the thing that all of these things have in common is that leading into the 1900s, these issues with snake oil salesmen and the medical claims leads to the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. And when you get to the, the issues with cigarette advertising and alcohol advertising, cigarette advertising leads in 1965 to the Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Act, which is actually amended four years after that to completely banish cigarette advertising on TV and radio. And then even going back to our example of spam, spam actually led to a couple of laws for us. One was in 1991. It's actually a Telephone Consumer Protection Act, which affected things like telemarketing, it, it, it extends today into things like text messaging restrictions, and it applied to fax machine spam. But then when we get to 2003, we see the Can Spam Act, which specifically starts telling advertisers what they can and can't include in email messages, and requirements of things like the fact that they have to provide an unsubscribe for you to opt out of it if you don't want to receive it. Now today, you know that when you see an ad, you have the assurance from all of these laws 